Hello, BookTube. All right, we're continuing with this library tour for 2023, although I don't know why, <laughs> because it's not a record of anything. It's just me showing you a lot of books. I guess that's a good enough reason. And we're moving on to this next shelf, the next shelf in this bookcase, uh, which once again has the same content warning, I guess you could call it, trigger warning, as we had the last time, which is that this is going to be all canonical classics. If for some reason you're not interested in canonical classics and you're wondering what's coming next on a library tour, you know, I love watching library tours too, but if you're not interested in canonical classics and you're wondering what comes next, well, for the next week or more, it's going to be just canonical classics in various different editions. So you won't be interested in this video if that's the case. Uh, I moved on to this shelf and I had to move some stuff. This is a, a fairly deep shelf. It's a normal shelf, unlike the top one. So there, there's room on the edge of the shelf for all kinds of knickknacks and bric-a-brac and also a deity, a certain deity that is now uh, over there glaring at me from across the, from across the room. Uh, so let's look at let's look at the, that stuff first. There's a penny. No idea why. There's a penny there. There's uh, my Legion flight ring uh, from my induction into the Legion of Superheroes. And there's a button, a little button of Superman. I, I, I sometimes people send me these things, and I'm always grateful, but. These things fly off any bag or shoulder or strap that I attach them to. They just, they don't stay. I don't know how people get them to stay on various things that they have. And then the other thing on the shelf is this. It's an actual book from Johns Hopkins University Press. This is uh, Anne Pippin Burnett's translation of the Odes of Pindar. That uh, is not, okay, it's not bilingual. I did, uh, this came out in, when did you come out? Uh, 2010. So before we were talking to each other, and I did a long review of this that was really a discussion of Pindar that I really liked. I really liked how it came out. Uh, again, no idea if it is findable, uh, because I don't have an internet archive. <laughs> I don't have an archivist. I don't have someone who's willing to say, I will do three hours a day uh, scouring the internet to find and clean and format everything that you've done and put it on steve.u.com. That has to be me. And uh, that's time consuming. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't done it yet. No idea if that old piece is available uh, anywhere uh, or what it looks like if it is. I'll look for it. As usual, I will look for it and see. Uh, and then we have the books themselves. So uh, we'll start with this first one. This is uh, from Liverite. This is uh, the annotated Mrs. Dalloway, Merve Emre. Uh, just a big annotated edition of one of Virginia Woolf's two great classics. Uh, we have a uniform set of Homer. Oh, God, what's going on here? We have a uniform set of Homer. These are the Fitzgerald, Iliad, and Odyssey. Uh, I did the covering for this one. This one doesn't have one. I will put a library dust jacket cover on it. Not all of my Homers are together, obviously, right? We saw the Richmond Lattimore Homers are, are in a different bookcase altogether. Uh, and what, oh, <laughs> okay. Well, I mentioned this yesterday, or the other day, in compa in connection with another book, in connection with Jack London. I showed you a big, fat, running press trade paperback of the collected Jack London, which I love, those running press paperbacks. I think there are only four. I think they did four authors. Jack London, Edgar Allan Poe, Mark Twain, and William Shakespeare. And this is the William Shakespeare, which is just blizzarded with stuff. It's just stuffed with stuff. I will, the next time that I see another copy of this, I will grab it and, and triply and quadruply reinforce it, because this thing is not going to last forever. I love just the, the design of the cover, the, the wording, the, 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 the way the letters play into the things that are in here, I just, the way it fits in the hand. I just love it. This is not a critically great edition of Shakespeare at all, but I love it. It's my favorite one. It's the one I go back to over and over again. Oh, all right. And then this, here we have uh, a little thing I don't even know who produced this. And this was uh, stuck in my closet forever and ever. And then David Murphy came for a visit. And at one point, uh, we opened the closet to my room so that I could look for stuff in there, put stuff in there. I, and I like to do that. I like to open that closet when I've got help because it's a, it's a little bit of a physical undertaking. And I found this little booklet when I was in there. And then David Murphy and I came out of the closet. <laughs> So, uh, and this is uh, yet more Pinder. This is Richmond Lattimore's translation of, of some of the Odes of Pinder. 
Uh, so I, I, I found it in that closet where it had been boarded up for months, even though it is a legitimate book in my collection. I mean, it, it's not only a legitimate translator or a great classical author, but it has a, a tipped in review <laughs> from, uh, uh, this was a Yale University Press translation of, of Pindar by D.S. Karn Ross. And it's reviewed here for the New York Review of Books at, by Bernard Knox. So that, it's a legitimate book, and it was just sitting in that closet. I, I wonder how many other books are in there. We didn't do a full-scale search. Uh, then we have War and Peace in a huge... This is the Anthony Briggs translation in a huge um, hardcover. I have the, we saw the Anthony Briggs translation already of Tolstoy, of War and Peace, in a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. And I also have the Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition as an ebook. Why I have the hardcover, I don't know. Uh, okay, then we have more Homer. This is uh, George Chapman's translation of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Very strange translation to modern years, a very strange translation. I love them, absolutely love them, but they don't read anything like. Of course, they were written, they're written in thunderous uh, Elizabethan long lines that. Uh, don't have any counterpart today. They don't have any natural readership today. I was very happy for uh, who did this. Princeton uh, brought out Chapman's Homer, and that was that was terrific. And then uh, uh, Paul Dry books. Who is you are an imprint of who? Who are you an imprint of? Paul Dry books. Uh, Simon and Schuster. Well, this is, uh, they also brought out uh, a great old classic, and I grabbed it right away. This is Ovid's Metamorphoses, which we've already seen. We saw it in the Horace Gregory translation. And this is uh, the Arthur Golding translation <laughs> from 1567. Uh, this is, this is, uh, well, it's, it's, this is, Ovid is by far the most represented poet in the works of, of William Shakespeare. And this is the Ovid that he knew. But, uh, it, it's much like the Chapman Homer in that it's it's antiquated would be the nicest way to put it. There's no there's no readership for it. Now then we have let's see here. This is who did the honors for you? Hmm? Uh, Anne Wiseman. This is uh, Julius Caesar's battle for Gaul. But this is this is a heavily illustrated thing with uh, troop disbursements and. Uh, maps and whatnot but this is just uh caesar's commentaries this is this is just it's a translation of caesar it's not a study of him uh then we have uh, this is a lovely thing but i don't know i don't know i i this is a lovely thing this is a barnes and noble uh classic of emma not the collected jane austen which i have but just emma in, uh, you're not going to be able to make it out on camera, but this is kind of a rubbery feel to it. Very durable feel. Lovely uh, cloth bookmark. Beautiful designs on the end papers there. Just uh, just an absolutely lovely edition of Emma. And this was, I think, $10 or $15. I got it at, at Barnes & Noble back when there was a Barnes & Noble at the Prudential Center. And uh, in the back of my head, I was thinking, you know, all getting all of these would be a really good idea. They, they are really, these are really good, durable, beautiful single editions of Jane Austen, which I don't otherwise have. Uh, I once upon a time had the Liverite, I think it was Liverite, uh, the, the whole set of their annotated Jane Austen. They did an annotated volume for everything, and they were all great. And I don't have them anymore. I got rid of them for some reason, for uh, somewhere along the line. I got rid of all of those volumes that I patiently got from publishers over the years until I had them all. And that was kind of my plan with this. I don't really need annotations or scholarship or even introductions for Jane Austen. And these are really nice. And then that Barnes & Noble closed. So I only have the one. <laughs> I don't know I don't know where I would ever find the others and what kind of shape they'd be in. So I don't know whether I don't know whether or not to keep this one. Uh, <laughs> I guess we're I'm encountering problems even in the classics bookcases. That war and peace is a problem. That Emma is a problem. It is a singleton. It is cut off from the rest of society. Uh, then we have uh, The Five Books of Moses, a translation by Robert Alter. Lovely uh, trade paper back here that is stuffed full of commentary. <laughs> this is uh, fantastic, and certainly, as you've seen already on this 
library tour. It's not the only Bible <laughs> or even part of a Bible that's in this world. Okay, then we have another classic. This is Steve Alton's novel, Meg. Two words, Jurassic Shark. <laughs> this is, this is, well, well, it might be a classic in its day. You don't know what time we'll have to say about it. <laughs> it is a, the story of a giant prehistoric albino 60-foot killer shark <laughs> that makes its way to the surface world and wreaks havoc. <laughs> is that any less believable than a lot of the other things we've been seeing? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, then we have the David Ferry translation of the Aeneid. Uh, I, I, again, stuff full of uh, reviews and whatnot. This is something that I've waited for. When did this come out? 2017. I waited eagerly for this thing. I was not overly impressed by it, but uh, it's a major Aeneid, so I, uh, I definitely kept it. <laughs> okay. Uh, then we have Dennis Washburn's translation of The Tale of Genji in the trade paperback with a lovely open letters blurb on the back there from yours truly. I wrote this up. Uh, got an advanced copy from the publisher that is long gone. Wish I still had it. Uh, then I got the hardcover from the publisher, and then I got the paperback and was delighted to see that Edith Grossman is on here, the great translator of Don Quixote. Uh, Valerie Hen Henituk, uh, who wrote a book about Sei Shonagon, about the, the pillar book of Sei Shonagon, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, and also me. Very nice <laughs> to have that. Uh, oh, okay, well, speaking of me, <laughs> and when are we not on this channel, uh, there's also the Michael Katz translation of War and Peace. In the hardcover. And ordinarily, as we saw with the Tale of Genji, I would need to wait until the paperback release to get a blurb. Uh, but in in this case, I was blurbed and I got an advanced blurb for the hardcover. So I am on the back. Steve Donahue is on the black, on the back, along with James Choice, Virginia Woolf, and Harold Bloom. <laughs> the only time I am likely to be sharing a cover with those with those people. <laughs> Uh, but I really, really like the cat's translation. Uh, what have we got here? What is this? Oh, all right. This is uh, an old volume of the Poems of Catullus, translated by Horace Gregory, who did this, who did this translation of Ovid. I didn't. It didn't have any any kind of a cover at all. It just had a blank cover. It obviously was designed to be a textbook, so I put a cover on it. Uh, okay. Then we have another Barnes and Noble edition. This is considerably older than the Emma. This was in the, the first line. In fact, this was the first one. This was the first uh, custom-made remainder, custom-designed remainder, custom-designed classic reissue that Barnes & Noble did back in the, in the early 1990s when they thought we should get into publishing textbooks, school books, classics for the library because there's almost no overhead except what you outlay on design and we get all the profit. Uh, and so they did a version of Moby Dick that is still the prettiest thing they ever did. Their Gulliver's Travels is terrific. If I could find their Gulliver's Travels, it would certainly be on this shelf. But this is still the nicest thing they did, I think. It's got sewn binding. It's got uh, a preface by Mark Halpern and illustrations all throughout by Mark Summers. There is one, his, his author thing for... Uh, I remember you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Find me. Uh, okay, here let's let's recover. All right. So he also did color uh, pictures all throughout here of this Moby Dick, and it is absolutely lovely. Look at that. There's the ship high above the whale. Uh, this is just a, a wonderful thing. I grabbed this uh, when it came to my Barnes and Noble. We got a little stack of these in the mail. I was always in the receiving room just opening boxes at random and seeing what was at, what was back there. It was sometimes an, an absolute mess. This was in the pre-Superstore days when things were done very ramshackle. And I had just been hired, and I went into the receiving room and said, well, okay, you're doing these things one box at a time just in co according to what falls next to your hands, but I can see on this pile of boxes... The, the ones in the back here are new releases from the publisher. We should get those out right away. Those should be, you should be opening those before you open anything else. And uh, the, the kids in receiving were saying, well, 
you know, no manager has said that. I'm saying, well, but I'm saying it. These are new releases. It says so right there on the box. That's what we're here for. You've got to do that first before you do backstock. And uh, eventually, we came to an understanding <laughs> that when Steve did his uh, his T Rex Jurassic Park stomp through the room and picked out things, that was what you would <laughs> you would open and receive next. And when I found a whole box of these, I was tempted to get them all. I think they were ten dollars a piece. Uh, and I didn't. I got one, and it, I, I read it and wore it apart. And then I, somebody, one of you, sent me a brand new copy. Went, I guess, online and found a brand new copy. Uh, and then we'll finish up this shelf with, uh, once again, Beowulf. <laughs> I guess I guess every shelf is going to have Beowulf. This is the classic cover for the Seamus Heaney Beowulf, uh, which I am... Uh, the Tale of Genji... Uh, I will be a guest star on Classics and Company. Uh, Micah Cummins and Anne Novella are doing a year-long event where they read classics, and they're having a guest star for each book that they do. And they're doing Tale of Genji, and I will be the guest star for that. That's later on this year. And then in April, uh, Micah Cummins and I are doing a buddy read of Beowulf. And because Beowulf is so short, we're doing a different translation every week in April. Excuse me, every week in April. And then we'll be finishing up with uh, not a translation. We'll be finishing up with John Gardner's novel, Grendel, which is not much longer than Beowulf itself, so not much of a strain on anybody's reading budget. And we just learned uh, just yesterday that David Wiley wants to be part of that, so that's fantastic. He will be joining us to read Beowulf. I was speculating to Micah that maybe this is the start of a trend. Hmm? We've had a buddy read for a couple of months now, face forward-facing, so that you can see what we're doing. It's not just a private thing. Uh, but maybe we're going to start gathering volunteer co-hosts for every buddy read that we do. Wouldn't that be fun? But that's on for April. You don't need to be a co-host. You can just join us. We're doing a different translation every single week for April. So we're starting uh, next weekend, this coming weekend, with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who did a translation of Beowulf. And then we're moving on to Penguin Classics, whoever the Penguin Classics is currently because they have an enormous amount of reach in schools and whatnot then we'll move on to burton raffle who we've already seen on this shelf tour where are you burton hmm? you and there you are <laughs> i might as well show you these props we will move on to burton raffle next who for our half a century was a best-selling beowulf translation and then we're, we're moving on to this which for going on half a century now is a great is a great best-selling translation of beowulf uh, so I guess that's two shelves in a row where there is a Beowulf translation. <laughs> I have a lot of Beowulf translations in this room. I have a lot of duplicates of all of these things in, in this room. This room is slowly being, uh, I know you can't tell from our previous tours, but this room is slowly being colonized by canonical classics, and that's okay with me. As long as I find good editions, I'm fine with that. Uh, editions that I really like. So there you go. That is this shelf. So I am going to uh, clean up the next shelf and move Lord Ganesha back to where he belongs for this shelf. Uh, and then we will resume. So I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.